pray with me this morning. Father, thank you for this word. Thank you that your word is alive and active. God, this passage compels. It intrigues us. There is beauty that we can see in it. But the reality of it is, is hard to imagine. And God, I pray this morning by your spirit that you would press these words, these truths, these joys into our hearts, into our minds, that we might too be a people that can boast and welcome and love the ways in which we are weak so that your power might be on display in our lives and in this church. I pray all this in Christ's strong name. Amen. Amen. Well, last, let's see, we're in November. So yeah, this was last month. Uh, in October, Claire and I took the boys to the Arboretum for the whole pumpkin patch. We're walking around on this Saturday morning. And, you know, if you went this year, I think it was, uh, what was it? What was the theme? Charlie Brown. I know, I had Snoopy in my head, and I was like, that's not right. But Snoopy was there. It was Charlie Brown. Uh, it was beautiful. It's always a fun experience. And, of course, the kids just love to go in that little, like, hay patch maze and run around. Uh, I've got some good pictures. I'll show you a crew. Just total mess. But I remember not that long into kind of our, our hanging out around there, I see these people that have, like, these, you know, 3D movie glasses on. And there was a number of them. And, and they were all, like, looking around surface, you know, eye level. And I remember being like, man, we're missing out here. Like, there's some kind of 3D display or something going on in the pumpkin patch. Like, we're not able to see what all these people are seeing. And it was literally hours later that we walked to the big open field where they, also, where they often play the concerts at the Arboretum, where I see a, a bunch of people that actually worked at the Arboretum with these same glasses, but they were all looking up. And it clicked in my head. <laughs> this wasn't a 3D maze. This is about the solar eclipse, I guess, that was happening that day. <laughs> And they, they were kind enough to, to let me put them on and look up there. And it was incredible just to see what was happening that, you know, I, I literally took the glasses off. And then just to kind of test the strength of my eyes, I looked up there. And I remember it was like blinding for like five minutes I couldn't see. I was like, that's why you wear those glasses. <laughs> and I, I've been thinking about that image, that analogy in my life. Because particularly in this text and particularly in the Christian life, Often what we find is that God in his grace by the Holy Spirit, he, he gives us this opportunity to have these, these glasses. That though we are a part of the world, though we're in this place and we're here to be a witness and to be a light, we are to have a different sort of perspective when it comes to a host of things. And I've been thinking about this, this idea of weakness and persecution and trials and hardships and the way that Christians are supposed to see and embrace them, much like those glasses where when they're on and when they're properly looking at the object, they're working as they should be and it's effective. But I couldn't help but have this image of the ones who are at the pumpkin patch who were either wearing them or on their head, but they were like looking eye level and it was like, that's not what those are intended for. And I just, I just I further to draw this out, I just get this image that so many of us have not tapped in, that we're kind of wandering around eye level, particularly when it comes to this issue of weaknesses and difficulties and the thorns in our life. And so my hope this morning is that we would see, like Paul, kind of walk this path this morning and be able to walk out of here more fully aware of what it is that we have able to put on and to live out. And it is a a beautiful thing where, like me with the, the people wearing the glasses, you will walk around and they will see you and say, what are those and can I put them on? And so I just want to walk through this in three parts, really just walking through the text. And uh, the first is the first six verses where we kind of get this picture of this spiritual mountaintop experience that Paul has. So I, I want us to look at that. And then I want us to look at this, this concept of a thorn that was given to him. And then finally, the power that was unleashed in his life in light of the progression. And so let's look at this. The first six verses, if you saw, is kind of some confusing language. There's third person and first person talk. There's in the heavens or paradise language. Like what is happening here as Paul is speaking of this spiritual experience? And again, it's worth noting that throughout the, the book of 2 Corinthians that Paul is having to defend himself because there are some apostles that have come in and, and basically kind of rallied the Corinthians in their favor and in their direction. And, and as Paul being the guy that was given by Jesus himself the ministry of the gospel to the Gentiles, that Paul wasn't so concerned about his 
following, what he was concerned about was the gospel of Jesus taking root in these people's lives. And he knew that if they were to reject him, they were to reject the gospel. And so you get in this part where he's talking about, I don't really want to boast, but here I'm going to boast. And then he starts talking about this person. Well, this person he is speaking of is Paul. And it's really fascinating because he begins to give us this picture of something that happened to him 14 years ago. If you saw it, it says he was taken up into the third heaven. Later, he says, caught up into paradise, whether in the body or, or out of the body, I don't really know. God knows, but I heard and saw things that I cannot utter. And, and there's some debate on that. Is it like just something that he, he literally can't speak of? Or is it that the human language just, there's nothing, there's no words to put to the experience that he had. That there's this sense of he, he was taken up and had fellowship with God in a way that we one day will. But Paul in this experience, this kind of spiritual ecstasy, often for many of us, I think we can think about the ways in which we long for greater spiritual experiences in our life. But listen to what Paul says for. He doesn't long to have stayed in that place. In verse 6, you saw it. He said, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. I don't boast about this. He had never talked about this before. It was only when these apostles who were pulling them away began to speak about the revelations and spiritual experiences they had where Paul was like, well, I guess I got to bring out the trump card. And so he speaks of this experience, but Paul has learned a really important experience that I think most of us have learned mostly by trial, that conceit and ego and self-sufficiency is a really, really dangerous thing. That, that when that begins, that self-exaltation, that for him it could have been this spiritual experience if you think about it, that he could have begun to have this sense of, man, I, I really am like pretty special. I am carved out by God, like I'm blessed. You know, he has marked me out on this path. And, and again, you can think about the ways in which that could boost self and pride and ego. And yet Paul knew that, man, there's something in me that, that wants to go that direction, but I know that it wouldn't end well for me. And so for us this morning, just as we make our kind of way through this text, it's, it's, an, it's helpful to think through what are some of the things in your life, the experiences that you may have that might tend towards that sense of building ego or conceit or self-sufficiency in your life. I think there's many, and, and again, you got to remember, this is a spiritual thing, like this is a good thing. It can often be the good things that can begin to, to build this sense of security that is really rooted in self. I thought about a couple, obviously, money. It's probably the most alluring, right? That, that that amount of money you have is equated to, like, the security, the comfort that you have in life, the status you have. And yet we see on display how often not only does it not actually fulfill and satisfy in the way that we think it will, but it can be taken in a moment. It's not a good place to build that sense of your identity and your importance and what drives you in life. Furthermore, success. You think about achievements and success and the way that promotions might come with that. Though it's good to be excellent in our work, we can begin to really be intoxicated by that pursuit of success. Right? That says something about who we are. It, it, it means we're valuable. Not only to the organization or whatever it is you're a part of, but we feel this sense of value in that. Coupled with all these things, you know, you can divvy these up in different ways, but the praise of man, just the approval of people, the sense that you look out and people like you, that they'll speak nice things about you. You know, I think about, I'm not in this stage yet, but you think about kids grow up, the colleges they go to, the schools they're a part of, the institutions you're tied to, right? Like these sorts of things are, are some of the ways in which conceit and ego can begin to build. And even here, the sense of spiritual experience, the pursuit of just more spirituality can even be something like that. And what's interesting is that if you actually just follow the path of the Bible, the extraordinary spiritual experiences often come with really serious consequences. You think back to Jacob who wrestled with God and what happened? That he wrestled with God, but he left that wrestling, that experience with a limp. That you see when, when somebody has this sort of encounter with the living God, that what often happens is you walk away not with a swagger but with a limp. 
That's the mark of somebody that has been in the presence of God. And so Paul here, if you see, this is the transition to the thorn, but he says, beginning in verse 7, so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me to keep me from becoming conceited. And so this this concept of a thorn is really important for us this morning because this is the place where we can all understand and connect to. We all have pain points in our life. You know, this word here in the Greek kind of speaks to a surgical instrument that that pierces. It speaks to uh, like a fish hook. And I, I couldn't help but think for a minute of, I don't know if you've ever been like hooked by a fish hook. You're not supposed to be, obviously. It's meant to hook the fish. But I, as I thought about this image, this word, this sense of a thorn, that fish hook with treble, if you've ever seen a treble hook, I'll never forget, I was in Albany doing youth ministry, and I've got a truck full of kids, and they are so excited to go fishing, that, so much so, one of them hooked his thumb before we got out of the truck. And, you know, I didn't know how bad it was, but I look back there, and I mean, again, if you know the treble hooks were on the back end, it, it, I mean, it was through his finger bad. And so I'm like, man, what do I do here? This is a new experience. I tell the other kids, get out of the truck. I'm trying to think through what to do here. I kid you not, this is like middle school ministry summed up. About 30 seconds later, I hear a kid yelling out for help, and I'm like, they are messing with me. And one of the kids got out of the car, ran around, and got stuck in a cattle guard. (laughs) I I had no compassion for that. I was like, that's just kind of dumb. I don't know how you got in there and how you got stuck in there, but like you're option two here right now. I got to deal with this fish hook. You actually need to stay there for a minute. And that, you know, I, it was actually just a really serious kind of the way in which it went into his finger. And it was this process in which you actually had to hook the thing all the way through so that you could cut it and pull it back out. And this is, you know, just the pain that you saw on this kid's face as we did this, that this sense of a thorn is really carrying this idea that it's not this one-time prick, but it's this throbbing. It's this continual reminder of the pain. And that Paul says, I was given that. And yet I was given it for a particular purpose. Now, again, if you, if you read the scriptures often, it's fun to kind of, in the places in which there's gray area, you want to find out what it is. So, like, what was the thorn for Paul? People have spent and and pinned a lot of ink trying to figure this out. And, you know, there's a few different uh, suggestions. One being, you know, was this just persecution that he was experiencing as he was pushing the gospel for us? Just this continual thorn of people, you know, pushing him out as he was sleeping on rocks and no place to lay his head in prison. Was it just this sense of persecution in his faith? Was it temptation that he experienced, like a real serious just temptation that gripped him, that humbled him, that he never could seemingly seem to conquer, that some will kind of write and talk more about that? And the last is that there was some sort of a physical ailment. You know, some have talked about maybe epilepsy, that he experienced seizures in his travel, that this was something that constantly came to him. There's some talk about maybe he had this eye, this serious eye illness, uh, which is connected to some things that he says in Galatians. But You know, it's fun to think through what might that have been, but let me tell you, it is such a gift by the Spirit of God that that is not played out for us. Because I can't tell you over the years and over the centuries how many people have come to this passage with a thorn in their life that is throbbing and they feel like they can put their thing into that place. They can relate. That had, had it just been clearly spelled out, it really would have eliminated for a lot of us the opportunity to press into what the thorn is in our life and to see hope through it and what might God be doing through it. And so as we read this, though we don't know what that is, we are left to connect this dot really in our own lives. That as you think about the thorns and the painful points in your life, what might those be? You know, I, I've, again, being in the life of a church, there's many relationships and things that you're aware of. I know for some, it's this sense of as your children have grown up that there is some real struggle. There are some real things that you had hoped would turn out for them that hasn't. That it's this painful reminder as you lay your head on on your pillow at night, just wishing that would be resolved. But it's something that, again, you, you are forced to at times just cry and pray and this thorn For some of us, again, it's health. 
health of ourselves, the health of loved ones. I mean, have we not seen this on display in the life of our church in this year? It's fickle. And when that news hits, it is crippling. It is a thorn. God, what are you doing? This hurts in ways unimaginable. Marital conflict, relational rifts. Talk about, again, this, these things that continue to prod and remind and conflict and hurt. Financial difficulties, insecurities, physically, emotionally, spiritually. Or again, this is one I know is true of myself and also I hear often, but sometimes just circumstances and seasonal difficulties in life that you kind of begin to just say, if I could just get past this, right? If we can just get through this on the other side, then we're kind of going to be in that better place. And, and what Paul is wanting to reorient us is to say, you know what? We're not supposed to just coast through to the other side. That God might actually be doing something in the painful thorns in our life. Do we see it that way? Because though it's unclear what Paul's thorn was, what's really clear is the intent of it, and it's to rid him of conceit. And the same is true for us, that as people that tend towards ego and selfishness and self-sufficiency, the intent is will you let it strip you in the way God longs to strip you of those things. I think there's a few important things to note here. You know, for Paul, this happened 14 years ago, first time we're hearing about it. This isn't, you know, something that, He's maybe gotten this perspective and head around right away that it's taken maybe some time for him to see this thing in this light. 14 years. I, you know, I think about that as Christians sometimes that we need to be careful to not, as somebody who's walking through something, just go straight to the, the grass greener thing that God is doing something. Know that be true, that Paul had time here to settle through this. You actually see, which is another important note, that he pleaded three times that God would take this away. Very reminiscent of the prayer that uh, was referenced this morning from Ryan as Jesus was in Gethsemane, that he prayed that his cross, the suffering might pass from him three times, but he said, yet not my will, your will, God. Paul pleaded, he prayed, and what's interesting here is God answers the prayer, but it's not in the way he longs for it. He doesn't take it, but he says, actually, this is a gift to you. It is a gift to give you something far greater than bypassing the thorn. And then you probably saw this too, it's interesting that he, he couches what God is doing through the thorn with, hey, to keep me from becoming conceited and at the end to keep me becoming conceited. But in the middle he says this messenger of Satan, that there's some, there's some rich theology in here, that he recognizes that not all thorns are just something that God is you know, happily giving to you, that, that, that Satan is at work in some of these things. And particularly the danger in our thorns, even as Christians, just because you experience them does not mean that you will experience the life through them that Paul does. That often these are the things that can cripple us and Satan would love nothing else than to do just that. For it to be the thing that unravels us, that steals our joy, that steals our perspective, that steals really our, our actual belief in who God is. That though we might assent in our head, we've lost it in our heart. And it's that checkpoint as well, that the way in which Satan will, will use those circumstances in your life, not towards kingdom things. And so though the thorn is cloudy, the purpose and the intent is really, really clear. And it's to rid us of that conceit. I, I have a front row view to this reality in the human heart every day with toddlers. And I, you know, uh, Crew is in this season right now as a two-year-old, the I do it phase. It is like wonderful, but also like the death of me. Because when you are trying to do anything efficiently and get anywhere, whether it be putting clothes on or getting in and out of the car seat or whatever it might be, crew says, I do it. <laughs> and there will be times when it's like you're trying to rush and, and hear the clothes and he's like, I got to do it. And he puts them on backwards, inside out, head is coming out of where the arm is supposed to go. It's like a mess. And I can't tell you how many times that I'm like, obviously, it's good for you to learn this as a child. But I'm like, you can't do it. <laughs> you actually can't do it. And, and I, I felt this sense in this text this week that, that so often that is our heartbeat as humans. We long for independence in a way that is contrary to how God has made us. God, I'll do it. Just let me figure it out. I can be smart enough. I can work hard enough. I can get through it. Let me do it. And it's in these thorns that God says you cannot. 
And if you don't understand that, I will bring you to your knees through the hardest things in your life. And it is my love for you that does that. Because ultimately, God cares too much about our holiness to let us walk down this path of destruction. That he will use pain, he will use sufferings, he will use the inconveniences of life to train and to mold and to form and to draw you more to him and away from self-sufficiency. And that is such a blessing. And what's awesome here is, as you'll see at the very end, that what is on the other side of this, that as we put on those glasses, as we begin to get trained in that, as we begin to wrestle, plead with God, it's not just this easy acceptance, but as we do that and experience just ultimately the weakness, the lack of ability, that on the other side of it is an incredible power. You see it here in the very end of this, verse 7 Uh, Sorry, verse 9, after pleading with the Lord three times that it should leave me, here's what he is responded to by God. He says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses. So that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Guys, this is the heart of what it means to be a follower of Jesus and to be his people. That we are like really weak people. And it is a beautiful thing. Because what he says on the other side of that is when you get to the end of yourself, I can actually now work. My glory can actually be on display in your broken marriage. My glory can be on display through your mess, through your sin, that through your trials and the thorns in your life, I can now show up. I I remember going down this trail. There's like so many, I mean, there's so much content now through all the different forms of media, but, you know, you can just find those little uh, Instagram videos or YouTube things where you just go down this trail you never thought you'd go on. I'll tell you when I went down. This guy who would walk around uh, like places that experience a ton of rain and there is just like flooding on sidewalks or streets. And this guy walks around with this metal rake and he'll go and he'll find where the drain is and he'll just like take this rake and go to work. And then what you begin to see is that all this water, it's like awesome. Like it just begins to find its way and just strength and it's like, oh, there's no more flood. It's all gone. And you watch one, then you watch a few. They're pretty fascinating. Again, it's very odd, I understand. But there was something therapeutic about it. I encourage you to watch it because, again, I I had this image in my mind that, that often, like, this pathway for us is this sense of, like, when you can let go of your ego, when you can realize that that's the most detrimental thing to your life and to your life in Christ, and you can begin to see this the way Paul sees it, as beauty, as grace, as God's kindness, that it's like that rake that just begins to unclog what's been clogged up. That it can actually now work effectively in the way that it was made to work and that there is power in that. That in some ways we need to be cautious. You could flip what Paul is saying here at the very end when he says, you know, when I am weak, then I am strong. Where we need to be most aware is when we actually feel most strong. That where in the ways that you feel really strong and self-sufficient, again, the place that we long to get to, I, I'm with you. We long to get in that place because that's where it's, it's easy. You know, I can still have my quiet time, like, but I don't need God the same way that I need him when I'm weak. But it's in that, that pursuit of strength often that we are most weak. I mean, it's the kingdom of God. It is upside down. And so it's like that natural check engine light when we feel that. And so what has to happen? And really, it's the sense of surrender. Like, have you surrendered in the way that, obviously, Paul has often, you know, again, very known and loved verses, right? I consider all loss as compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. That it is better that I actually go and be with him than it is to be here, but for your sake, I'll stay here. That Paul... Just, he, he believed. He surrendered. He, he handed the keys over 
Not one time to become a Christian, but like he, he lived into what it means to be a Christian, which is just to surrender it, to let it go. And you see the joy he had. You see the perspective he had that, that is so mind-blowing. I, I was looking up the history of, you know, some of the, the AA or type programs like that. And if some of you are aware that some of those things, you know, obviously were really started alongside Christian ministries. And so a lot of the language has maybe been taken out so that it's more inclusive of, across people who may not, may not know what they believe about God. But the first step I'm so fascinated by, it says that, Step one, we admitted we were powerless over fill in the blank and that our lives had become unmanageable. And, and really, like, that is the this, this first step of what it means to become a follower of Jesus. But it's also the first step of, like, almost daily renewal that we have come to believe that we are powerless. That if we are left to our own devices... Whatever it is, it doesn't have to be the, the really scary thing. It can be a lot of these other little things that are easier to hide, but it becomes unmanageable. And the danger for Christians is that we have such the source and the root to, to, to have this power, and yet when we hide it, we, we give up the power. We give up the work of God that is able to be on display in our lives. The man who started it, you know, he had an alcohol problem. This, he kept trying to get rid of it, and he, he had this awful relapse. And he comes to the hospital, and the guy who worked, I think it was called like the Oxford Group. It was kind of this coupling of what started AA. But he met him in the hospital, and he said this. He said, look, man, you need to realize you're licked, admit it, and get willing to turn your life over to the care of God. And I love that. Like, just realize it. Realize you're licked, that you need to admit it and get willing to continually turn your life over, that surrender, that that is really what is between us and experiencing the power. Authentic Christianity does not produce a race of superhumans who rise above need. The most perfect expression of authentic Christianity in this age is divine power received with the empty hands of human weakness and poverty and pain. Have you emptied the hands? even the thorns, the painful things. And you see the perspective he gets. Again, this would be the, the, could you imagine verse 10 if we believed this, if we could live into this? For the sake of Christ, then I'm content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. And you just think about that, all the ways in which in our own strength, I'm like, I'm not good with any of these things. Let alone insults, right? Like, how dare you? And, and just this, this humility, this power, that's power. And I love it because this is a, a quote that will lead us towards the close. I was going to have you guess who this quote is, but we quote him so often. It's Keller, and, and I love it. It's, this is what he says. This is how we get here. It is the gospel. Listen to these words. Every other religion and philosophy says you have to do something to connect to God. But Christianity says, no, Jesus came to do for you what you could not do for yourself. Every other religion says, here are the answers to the big questions, but Christianity says Jesus is the answer to them all. So many systems of thought appeal to strong, successful people because they play directly into their belief that if you are strong and hardworking enough, you will prevail. But Christianity is not just for the strong, it is for everyone, especially for people who admit that where it really counts, they're weak. It is for people who have the particular kind of strength to admit that their flaws are not superficial, their heart is, is deeply disordered, and that they are incapable of rectifying themselves. It is for those who can see that they need a savior, that they need Jesus Christ dying on the cross to put them right with God. That, that is the heart. That is what we believe. It is beautiful. It is for particularly the, those that are strong enough to admit they're weak. And particularly who are strong enough to confess that it's not just a little bit of disordering. It's totally disordered. God, we need you. That is this sense. That is where Paul lived. That's where he experienced God, meeting him by his grace. And so we see here that God's power doesn't replace weakness. It doesn't just overcome it, that it's actually precisely in it that his power is formed in you. I wonder if you would allow it to have that work in your life, that perspective, that, 
that joy to walk that path, the courage to continue to look to Jesus. We sung it this morning, in Christ alone. It is okay to not be okay. It is okay to share your weakness. And it's precisely one of the applications that a mark of a Christian community should be a community of people willing to share and be vulnerable about those real struggles, the real difficulty. Because when we get to that place, light is shown, grace is found, power is experienced. And so would we not hide? Would we share and embrace them? Would we lead others to this sort of freedom? And then ultimately, allow the thorns in your life even the really hard things that are hardship and suffering, would you allow those to pin you closer to Christ who imparts grace to the sufferer, both to bear the pain and the thorn and also develop these qualities of perseverance? And this is where I'll close. My friend sent me this quote this week. It was so good. But as we think about the coming birth of Jesus, where in the end was the greater power? In the basket made of reeds or in the might of Pharaoh's empire? And what you begin to see as Jesus comes on the scene, which we'll begin to do together next week, is that it was in the basket of reeds all the way back to Moses that what we begin to see is that power throughout the scriptures is found in the really weak and small things. I pray that we would be strong enough to be able to embrace that, to put on those glasses, to be a community that shows the power of God on display through his grace and our weakness. Would you pray with me as we come to the table this morning? Father, Um, we are grateful that this is who you are. That, God, you know so intimately the human heart and the human condition, the human dance, the ability to hide and conceal and to shade. You say it, God, the heart is deceitful above all things. And what we see in the person and the work of Jesus is is not just your love for us and that you would die to make us right with you. But what we see is the power of the resurrection. The power of God on display through through the path of suffering, through the weak things. That as the friends of Jesus came to the tomb to... To just come to grips with, did Jesus really die? What are we doing? They found that it was empty. That you had risen from the grave, that there is life through our thorns, that there is hope, that you are at work. I pray for those this morning that need to be reminded through the thorny things in life, God, that it is your gracious hand to to rid them of themselves, to not be self-sufficient, to not be independent, to not be reliant, but to realize it is in weakness, God, that there is beauty and strength and power. And Father, this is a everyday visual for us in reality as we come to this table. That is precisely what we're saying. Open hands, we receive you again. We cannot believe that you would receive us, but we know it to be true because of the cross. So God, we thank you, we praise you, we worship you humbly this morning. We pray all this in Christ's name, amen. From the night that Jesus was betrayed, he gathered with his disciples and after giving thanks, he took 